来 ，DJ 去票。Thank you. I heard a wild rumor. What? I heard you used to date Larry Ellison's uh, girlfriend. Oh. Did you hear that? For real, for real. But then what happened? He stole it from you? Man, guy. All right. All right. Uh, we'll, co <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Um, Larry Ellison's the founder of Oracle. He is the fifth richest person in the world. He owns a Hawaiian island, all paid for by databases. That's why this class exists. All right. So, all right. Uh, administrative stuff. So, the homework one uh, we do this, this coming Sunday on the 10th. Project Zero is also due on the 10th. Who here has not started Project Zero? One. Why not? Two. Do you know C++? That's a no. Do you know C++? Not, it's, okay, you should really start because like it's uh, if you if you if you know zero C plus plus it it will be a struggle. And again, we're not trying to do this to torture you. It's really meant to be like this is what the rest of the course is going to be like in terms of the projects. If you don't know how to write C plus plus and don't know how to debug it, you're going to have problems. Okay, print F or standard C out is not a debug method. Okay, uh, you know you, you want to use a debugger. And then project one will be released. Uh, it was supposed to go out today. Probably will come out Friday. Um, and that'll be on the buffer pool, which we'll start teaching in, in a week and a half. Okay? Any questions about homework one or project zero? Okay. All right, let's jump, jump into the material. So last class, we spent time talking about SQL uh, and the, the, whole, the, the modern things you can do with the CTEs, lateral joins, nested queries, window functions, and so forth. Um, prior to that, we talked about the relational model and relational algebra. And so at this point, that's the, the sort of the logical view of what the database system is going to look like that we're going to we're sort of mentally construct throughout the rest of the semester. So we're not going to go back to these, discuss these things, but we'll see how we need to know what SQL looks like or what relational model is in order to build the various parts of the system we'll be discussing going forward. So as I said at the end, end of last class, this point forward in the semester going forward, uh, up until around Thanksgiving, is going, to how, is going to be how to build a sort of a classic or canonical database, a relational database management system. So the, uh, the outline for, for going forward, we've, we've, we've already discussed what relational databases are. Um, but the, so the, the, the first four topics here are storage, execution, concurrency, recovery. These are the, 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 the aspects you would need to have to build a, a, a full-featured, safe, reliable database management system. And, it, for, for, and we'll assume it's going to run on a, on a single node. Right, because it makes your life easier. Don't go distribute until you have to. And then once we once we understand the, the, what a single node database system looks like, we'll we'll then discuss how to expand this and do distributed databases. And at the end of the semester, we'll talk a little bit also to about how what other additional features and optimizations we, we can apply, which then will be a segue into the advanced class if you want to take that in the spring. So the way to think about of a database managed system and sort of what, what, the way the course is laid out is a bunch of layers. And the different layers are going to provide different functionalities and capabilities for the database system. And they're going to expose an API to whatever the layer is, ab is above it. And it's the, the, the topics we will discuss, again, basically how to construct those layers, put it all together, and have a full-featured database management system. So the way to think about it is that the most simplistic sort of viewpoint would be the application comes along, uh, and they're going to issue a SQL query. And that's going to first show up and get parsed. Right? The, the string of text of the SQL query gets parsed. We'll run through the query optimizer. Uh, below that, then we'll start executing whatever the query plan is. There'll be access methods that, to actually talk to the, the, the tables or indexes, whatever, whatever we're trying to access. There'll be a buffer pool manager to manage the memory for our database system. And then at the lowest level will be a disk manager that'll be responsible for reading and writing data to disk. And so today's class, we're going to start, you know, beginning of the semester, we're going to start at the bottom and then work our way up. When we get to something like concurrent control and recovery, that's going to permeate throughout the entire system. So we're going to have to come back and revisit all of these things. Like when we're, when we're running transactions, we need to know where the hell, you know, what's on disk. Uh, we need to know what we're accessing, how we're accessing it, uh, what, what queries we're executing. Right? So the storage and execution will, will, will get us through the entire stack. And then we'll come back and touch it all over again. Uh, that sounds weird. But we'll, we'll look at it all over again um, you know, when, when we talk about concurrent control and recovery. And the same thing with distributed databases. We have to know about all these things in order to build a, a full, a, 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 you know, a reliable, safe distributed database system. Okay? 
All right. So for the system we're going to discuss, uh, the, the, the methods we're going to discuss this semester, we're going to assume that the architecture of what we're trying to build, again, think conceptually we're going to construct in our minds a, a database management system, and BusHub is one implementation of this. We're going to assume we're building what is called a disk-based database system, or a disk-oriented architecture. And this is where the database management system itself is going to assume that the primary storage location of the database is going to be on some non-volatile disk. It could be an SSD, a spinning disk hard drive. If you're running in the cloud, it could be S3. Right? But, but we're assuming that, it, that it's going to be disk-based. And all the things we're going to build in, in our database management system are really designed to now coordinate or orchestrate the movement of data back and forth from disk into memory. Right? This should not be you know, uh, news for anyone. This is the classic von Neumann architecture where the, the data is at rest on disk. We can't operate it unless we bring it into memory. And then the CPU can do whatever it needs to it. So this is, this is the overall you know, theme of what we're trying to build. And this is obviously going to be super hard. And this is, again, if you're an application developer, you don't want to be doing this yourself in your application code. Uh, you want a database system that knows how to do this reliably and safely and correctly and efficiently um, uh, to do it for you. So the way to think about what storage looks like uh, from our perspective as a, from a database system is in terms of this hierarchy. And you might have seen this in, in other classes or uh, other, other textbooks. right? And the way to think about this is that going from the bottom to the top, the, the, the storage devices are going to get faster but smaller and more expensive. So at the bottom layer here, you have something like network storage. Uh, this would be like EBS or S3. Um, I think actually in the, in, the, in the textbook, there's a layer below this. I think they have like tape drives, but nobody runs database systems off those anymore. Um, but like as you go up after network storage, then you have like a locally attached spinning disk hard drive. And then you have maybe like an SSD. And then after that, you have DRAM, then CPU caches, and, and, re and then now CPU registers. Right? CPU registers are, you know, are super fast. Uh, it's the fastest kind of storage you can have, but like we're talking, you have maybe I don't know, 32 registers on your CPU, and each one's going to be about 64 bits, right? So you can't store a lot of space in there, or st store a lot of things in there, um, but they're you know they're going to be super fast. So from our perspective in this semester, the only thing we really care about is this division line here, right? And that's between volatile and non-volatile storage, right? Obviously, what does volatile mean? We have volatile storage. What's that? Yeah, it says data's gone when, you, when, you, when your power's gone. And you pull the plug on your DRAM or your CPU registers, like everything gets wiped out. When you boot the system back up, nothing's still there. Non-volatile basically means that you write data to the device, and assuming that you make the right, correct calls to like, tell it to get flushed or you get back an acknowledgment, we'll, we'll cover that later, then we, we assume that data is going to be persistent. And that no matter if we uh, restart the system, pull the power, take the machine out, put it into another location, whatever, when we come back, that our data will be there. Of course, database systems, we don't trust the hardware. We don't trust the OS, too. We'll get that in a second. Right? We don't trust any of that. So like, we're going to do a bunch of extra stuff to make sure that if we write stuff, maybe we write to a multiple locations or we write a backup for it. Right? A bunch of things we'll do to make sure that we, we, we truly get non-volatile storage. But from the design of the, the architecture itself, we'll assume that uh, it's, you know, it's volatile versus non-volatile. Another key difference we're going to see between volatile and non-volatile is how we can access the data. So non-volatile storage will be considered to be byte addressable. What does that mean? Can query each individual byte. He says you can query each individual byte. Correct. Yeah. So let's say I have a one megabyte file. Uh, if I want the I want to get 64 bits at some random offset, I can do that in memory. There's cache lines, it's not exactly true, but for now we, we, we can ignore that. In a non-volatile storage, like think of like an SSD, you can't go get exactly 64 bits in a one megabyte file. You got to go get the block that that, one, that 64 bits is in, bring that into memory, and then do whatever you, you need on it. Right? So you can only address blocks, not individual, uh, individual bytes. And so the reason why this matters is that there'll be certain algorithms we'll choose in the design of our system where we know we're fetching blocks instead of single bytes or byte offsets. And therefore, we'll choose maybe an algorithm that is better for block addressable data. Related to this, we're also going to choose potentially algorithms that are, uh, that are maximize the amount of sequential access of our data. So what do, what do I mean by this? Yes? Accessing adjacent blocks is like cheaper, so we want to do sequential. 
right? So he said accessing adjacent blocks are, are cheaper, so we want to do that as much as possible. So again, say I want to get, uh, I want to get 10 megabytes, and I have, and, and, and they're, they're broken up to one megabyte blocks. If those one megabyte blocks are scattered in different locations, then I got to do, it's called random access to go jump to those different locations to get that data. Or alternatively, if it's all aligned together, contiguous, then in theory, I can do one fetch command. I'm not saying what the device is, but it's one fetch command to go get those 10 me one megabyte blocks. And that's going to be way more efficient, right? If you just think of like on a website or you know, dialing something up the internet, if I can go uh, open up a single connection and get all the data I need rather than opening up different connections, Right? The, the one fetch is going to be faster. At the hardware level, think of like a spinning disk hard drive. And laptops don't come with these anymore. They still exist in the enterprise world. But there's, there's a physical arm that's spinning around on a platter like a vinyl record right? like, that old people have. And so if you have to pop, move the arm to get data, moving that arm is it's a physical thing. It's expensive. It's, it's, you're actually moving something through, through, through helium. But you're moving something, uh, moving the arm on the platter. So, if I have to, if I can just move the arm once and then read a bunch of data without moving it again, that's sequential access. That's going to be faster. If I have to pick the arm up and move it over and over again, then that's going to be much slower. And again, we'll see this when we, when we, this will come up also in the execution algorithms. There'll be, will be certain uh, algorithms we'll choose that'll maximize sequential access, and we'll choose those over something that's more random access. And this is different than maybe how you think about algorithms in in, in intro classes because. In that world, they assume everything's always going to be, the, the memory access is always the same. In our world, we're dealing with real hardware, so we can't make that assumption. All right, so I'm going to talk about, so, okay, so the way we we'll think about this is that I'll use the term memory in this class, and I'll just mean here, I'll just mean, just mean DRAM. Um, and when I say disk, I'm going to mean anything below that, right? So an SSD, hard, a spinning disk hard drive, or, or a network cloud storage. The, the, the ones up here, the CPU registers, we won't discuss these in this class. Um, in the advanced class, we'll talk about different algorithms, different methods to try to maximize the amount of processing we can do of data in, in CPU registers or like L3, L2 caches. And in that world, you can make a huge difference. It's also worth noting there are some sort of emerging hardware devices or, or hardware that's available today that spans uh, different layers. So you can get sort of fast network storage or disaggregated storage or disaggregated memory, where this looks like um, it potentially could be byte addressable, but you're going over a you know a physical network, so it's a little bit slower. Uh, so it, it sort of straddles in between here. Um, and then there was something called persistent memory that uh, people have been dreaming about for a long time that would have sort of the best benefits of the, or have the byte addressability of DRAM, but also the persistence of of uh, an SSD. And it would actually sit in the dim slot, so you can write to it as if it was like a, a you know, memory. But if you pull the plug, everything gets retained. And this is something when I when I first started CMU uh, eight, ten years ago, um, we were spending a lot of time researching this. This is something that was very interesting to us because this, is, if we had this persistent memory, basically all the stuff that I'm going to talk about uh, in two weeks, actually project one in this class, basically goes away, right? Because I don't need to worry about moving things in and out of disk. Everything, my, my memory is persistent. Did anybody know if anybody, anybody actually tried to make this, this persistent non volatile memory? Yes? I guess you would try something with an SSD or hard drive with something attached to like Intel Octane or something. Boom, there you go. Yeah, so he said you could try this with an SSD. Yes, people do that, but that's not true persistent memory. Or then you said Intel Optane. Intel Optane actually wasn't an SSD, it was actually phase change memory. It was actually was a physical device that could do, it was persistent memory, right? HP had memristors. There was IBM rumored has something, right? Intel's the only one that actually made this. Who here has heard of Intel Optane? Well, he obviously, yes. Very, very few. It's, it's already dead. All right, so Intel killed it last year. Uh, basically, they, uh, Intel hired a new CEO, and they, they cut a bunch of divisions. And unfortunately, they, this, they cut this. And this sucks, because like, to me, this is like, this would have been a game changer, but Intel couldn't make any money off of it. And what sucks also, too, is like now no one's going to try this for another decade because if Intel could make money off of it, you know, who will? Right? But there was a, a various projects at, at different database companies. They were trying to build database systems just around persistent memory. Because, again, a bunch of the stuff we're going to have to do, but moving data back and forth between disk and memory goes away with this. So that, that's a shame. Okay. 
So the reason why we have to be cognizant of what the storage is going to look like is because the performance characteristics, uh, as I said, between these different devices are going to be dramatically different. And we're going to try to maximize the amount of work we can do for data when it's in memory. When we bring something in, off a disk into memory, we want to do as much work as we can on, on, that, on that data before we throw it away and bring something else into memory. Right? In an ideal world, our database would fit entirely in memory. Even then, you still have to write out the disk. But in some cases, that's, that's not always possible. So the way to think of this at the, at the CPU level, right? Uh, a cache miss is going to basically is going to one nanosecond. Getting out of DRAM is 100, 100 nanoseconds. An SSD is about 16 uh, microseconds or 16,000 nanoseconds. That's actually pretty good. Spinning disk hard drive, two, 2 million nanoseconds. And then EBS can fluctuate. Sometimes you get 50 milliseconds. Sometimes you get 500 milliseconds. Depends on how hot the data is. And then tape archives, again, this is. This is glacial. You, you, don't, you don't want to build any system off this. So this, this data comes from, uh, this particular data here comes out, there's a Berkeley website and a link there. It sort of shows you the trends of the hardware performance or the, the speeds of these devices over time. It's, this, this table has been attributed to Jeff Dean from the early 2000s. Uh, I, actually, I, I think it might predate him uh, before that. Um, and so as humans, it's, it's hard for us to reason about nanoseconds, right? Like one nanosecond, what does that actually mean? Or, or you know, two million nanoseconds, is that a long time? Um, and so there's a simple uh, trick you can do to realize how, how, much, how bad this actually is or how much slower things actually get if you just change one nanosecond to one second, right? Uh, so this is a trick that, or this is uh, something that Jim Gray used to do in, in the 90s. Um, if you just change you know, one nanosecond to one second, now you see how massively slower these other devices are. And you see why you want to keep everything in memory as much as possible, right? And so you think of like, if I have to read a page from a book, uh, and say, you know, doing L1 cache miss would be like me walking to this table and looking in the book, right? Or if I had to read from an SSD or, or DRAM, maybe it's walking over to the library and then finding the book, right? But if I have to read from a tape archive, it's 31 years. That's equivalent to like flying to Pluto, the planet, and then reading one book. So we want to avoid all of this as much as possible, okay? So the sequential versus random, we, we've occurred this, we, we, we discussed this already. But again, this is going to be a reoccurring theme uh, throughout the entire semester, where again, where the, the database system is going to prefer sequential access over random access for both reads and writes. Um, when spinning these hard drives, again, it makes a huge difference. But even on SSD, because of the way they, they actually work underneath the covers with the ASICs and then doing compaction and so forth, it, you're, you're better off doing uh, batch reads and writes sequentially as much as possible. Right? All right, so the other system design goals we're going to have and, and how we choose how we want to build our system. Uh, is that we want to give the illusion that we are, we are operating with the database entirely in memory. Again, for, for most databases aren't that big. Most databases are less than 10 gigabytes, right? Uh, but for really massive databases, like in, you know, in the terabytes, or gigabytes and terabytes and petabytes, um, ideally you want to give the appearance that everything's already in memory, even though it, it actually isn't. And there's tricks we can do to hide the disk stalls and, and so forth. And then as, since, since reading and writing disk is so expensive, uh, we want to do a bunch of other tricks in our design of our system to avoid prolonged stalls or having the system appear unresponsive, right? Because one, that'll frustrate the application or frustrate the user because they think, they think the system's stuck, right? You're just, but you're really fetching things from disk. But this also is going to cause other problems because if we're holding like a lock on something and we stall because we have to get something from disk or write something from disk, that's going to slow down everybody else behind us. Uh, and have a convoy effect. So we, there's a bunch of things, you know, for this reason, we want to avoid this as much as possible. And again, because random access is, is slower than sequential access, we want to maximize sequential access. So what does this all sound like? Having the appearance that we have more memory than we actually do. Virtual memory. All right, so we'll get this in a second. We'll, I'll explain why we don't want to do virtual memory from the OS and why, as, again, as a database system, developer, engineer, building the actual system, we always want to do as much as we can ourselves and never, not rely on the OS to do anything. So high level, this is, this is our diagram. This is what we're building. So we have some, some database file or files, plural. Uh, it doesn't matter. We'll cover, we, we can discuss the, the differences. But we have some database file that's on disk. And we're going to break it up into pages. And I'll describe what a page is in, in, in a second. And there'll be some directory that's going to say, here's what pages I have. Here's where to find them at this offset and so forth. And then there'll be some buffer pool where, uh, of memory that the data system is allocated, basically called malloc against the OS, 
got some memory. And then we're going to use that as the staging area where we bring pages in from, from disk. So now if the execution engine, the thing that's going to run our query, it comes along and it wants to get page number two. We can ignore how, how it knows it wants page number two uh, for now, but assumes that's what it wants. It wants page number two. So the very first thing we got to do is bring in the page directory, because that's going to tell us where, you know, where on, on disk are, the pages are. And then it'll make a call to the OS or whatever the device it is that, that's storing the, the, the database file, and it'll bring that page into memory. And then now the, the buffer pool will give back the execution engine a pointer in memory, a 64-bit pointer in memory of where this, uh, this page exists. And now it's up to the execution engine or the access method, the operators, to then interpret what's inside that page, because all that's you know opaque to the to the rest of the system. They don't really, it's not entirely true, but they don't, at this point they don't really need to know. And then let's say it wants to do a bunch of updates. It, it makes makes changes to whatever's in page number two. I'm not saying whether it's a tuple. I'm not saying whether it's an index. It doesn't matter. And then now the data system is responsible for writing this back out to, to disk to make sure that any changes are persistent. So this is this is effectively where we're going for the next three or four lectures. Okay, this is, this is the architecture we're going to be building. So we'll discuss what pages look like uh, in the next three lectures, three, four, and five. We'll discuss uh, how to write things out to disk in six, uh, and what the, how to manage memory in six. And then we'll discuss how to execute the queries uh, up here in 12 and 13. Okay? So our focus really today is what are these things on disk? Okay? So I said before, what does this sound like? Everyone said virtual memory. And you say, okay, well, why do any of this, you know, why take the next three lectures talking about what's, it, what's well, you, you need this lecture, but why take the next two lectures after that talking about how to manage memory back and forth from disk when the OS can do that for us? Do anybody know what's the syscall you would use to, to, let, to use virtual memory in this way? MMAP. MMAP. Beautiful. Excellent. So answer memory map file. So this is in the POSIX standard. Uh, Windows has their own version of it. But this allows you to take the contents of a file that's on disk and you map it into virtual memory uh, in, in your process, in the address space of, of your process. And then now that process can jump to any offset in that address space in memory. And the OS is responsible for deciding, oh, is the thing you need in memory or not? If not, then it goes and fetches the, the page you need and brings it in memory. All right? So the database system doesn't, is not doing any of the reads and writes. It just um, MMAP opens the file. And the OS does all the, the management of the data, moving the data back and forth for us. All right, so it sort of looks like this. We have an on-disk file. We have a bunch of pages. Right? We call MMAP to open it up. And then we'll have a concept of virtual memory and, and, and physical memory. So virtual memory would be what I see in my process address space. And I can, again, at some starting location, I'll get the, I'll get the MMAP file. And then the, these virtual memory has to be backed by physical pages. So as I touch a page, the OS has to go then put it into some space in physical memory and then update the wiring for the virtual memory table. All right? So let's say that my process want to touch, wants to touch page one. So we would have a page fault because the, the OS would recognize I don't have page one in physical memory. It would go out the disk, fetch it for me, put it in, update virtual memory to now point to it. And then my, my process can, can touch it or do whatever it wants with it. Same thing now if I, I want page three. It's not in there. I get a page fault. The, the OS blocks my process. When I, do the, when I access it, it goes, fetches the page I need from disk, updates the wiring, and, and then, uh, then my process can, can start running again. My thread can start running again. What happens when I, if I want to touch page two? What's that? Is to get rid of it, right? But what happens while I'm getting rid of it? My process stalls, right? I go to, the OS is going to block me. While it says, okay, well, I don't have any more physical memory. Let me go out and figure out what do these one, one, you know, page one or three, which one should I throw away, right? But the OS is going to have its own internal statistics about uh, how these pages are being accessed, and it, it's going to make a decision about what page to evict. But it doesn't know anything about what we're doing inside the database system because it just sees reads and writes. It doesn't, like, on, like at, at a core screen, it doesn't know what queries are, doesn't know what's in these data pages, what's in these files. So the OS is going to try to make a decision on how to swap things out. And that's just, again, for eviction. There's a whole bunch of other problems that we're going to face if we rely on the OS to do this for us. So in my first example here, I showed one thread, right, or one, one process with accessing it. But again, we're going to try to build a database, a modern database system that can take advantage of 
multiple cores or multiple CPUs. Uh, and so we need to have multiple threads access them. But now what if one of them, uh, you know, one of them touches something, writes it, and then another guy tries to read it, but it gets stalled because it gets, it gets evicted, right? The ordering can get kind of screwy. And again, the operating system doesn't know anything that's going on, what's running inside the system at the same time. So if everything's read only, it's OK, right? Because we're not dirtying any pages. The OS can swap things out. It'll be good enough. And there are some cases, there are some data systems that do use MMAP just for sort of read-only parts of the system. But if you now need to have multiple writers, uh, which again, in a real system, we're going to want this, then, then there's a bunch of other problems. So the first one is transaction safety. This is the one I, I sort of mentioned. Like, if I have a, a transaction that updates multiple pages, I need to make sure that these pages are actually written out in the right order. And the OS doesn't know that because it just solves, sees dirty pages. It doesn't know anything about, does this page need to be written before this other page? You can do some things like you can lock the page using mlock, that, but that only prevents the OS from swapping it out. It doesn't prevent it from writing out. So now it may write out a dirty page that it shouldn't have. I crash and come back, and now I have changes in, that shouldn't have been written to disk. And I have to go figure out how to reverse that or deal, deal with the, 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 the you know, bad data, inconsistent data. We've already talked about doing stalls. Uh, again, if you try to access something that's not in memory, you get a major page fault. The OS blocks your thread, deschedules you. The, the disk scheduler go, goes, get your page, brings it in. And when it's available, then you get rescheduled. Your thread gets rescheduled again. But now your thread is blocked in doing nothing, right? And it may be there are other queries you could possibly run uh, while you're waiting for that thing to fetch, get fetched from disk. So then you say, OK, well, maybe I'll make a, a, a disk dispatcher or a scheduler so that there's only one thread that goes and gets things. And if there's a page fault, he gets blocked, and then I can run other, run other threads. But now you're kind of, again, you're building more infrastructure around the limitations of, of MMAP. Next problem you have is how do you handle errors, right? If I, if I in MMAP, if I try to access a page that, for whatever reason, is corrupted or not available, there's, there's some, some hardware problem. You don't get an exception as you would if you, if you write it in user space code. You get a SIG bus in, interrupt. And now you need a signal handler all throughout the rest of your system because you may be doing something that is in a critical section that you don't want to get inter interrupted or, 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 or break. So therefore, you have to have an interrupt handler to make sure you, you can go back to the thing you were doing before uh, to, to handle that, this, this interrupt. Because right? this, is, this is the only sort of, uh, this is how the operating system tells you things are going bad. You can't get back an error code. You get back a, an interrupt. I need to say that's a lot of engineering to, to handle this. It's, you don't want to do this. And then there's obviously going to be performance issues. Uh, and this is because the, database, the, the operating system is going to have its own internal data structures about what's in memory and not in memory, uh, what's getting scheduled or not getting scheduled. And it has to protect those critical sections inside its own data structures right, with mutexes or whatever. Uh, and now that's going to be a contention point. Whereas in a database system, since we know what queries are trying to do, because again, SQL is declarative, we know what the queries want to do because we have the physical plan, we know what the data they're trying to access, and therefore we can, we're in a better decision to decide how to schedule things. Yes? His question is, do database systems have the privilege to work with hardware directly? There are methods called kernel bypass where you can... Uh, or NVMe is sort of like this. There's ways to, to make calls to hardware without having to rely on the OS. The problem with those things are you basically have to free implement a bunch of the OS back in, up inside the database system. So uh, there's something called, um, this is a tangent, like if you don't want to have to use the, the OS's TCP stack for networking, there's something called um, uh, the, the, the the DBDK from Intel, the data plane data kit or development kit, basically it's a way to hook directly in the hardware and you get raw packets out. But again, it's raw packets. If it's a TCP connection, now you've got to keep track of like the TCP headers and all that, right? Uh, very few database systems do this. I only know two. One was uh, one's yellow brick. We'll discuss them throughout the semester. They have a bunch of amazing stuff. They basically rewrite their own. They basically only use the OS to turn the thing on, and they never call malloc again. They allocate all the memory, everything beginning. They wrote their own TC, uh, PCIe drivers. They do a bunch of amazing engineering. Few people do that. The other one was, was ScaliaDB, but the, the DBDK was so difficult to handle that they, it was a huge pain they don't do it. So 
the answer to your question is, um, for some things, you have to go through the OS. Uh, the, in the 80s, they got really crazy, and like they, they wrote, instead of using a file system, they wrote their own storage layer on top of like raw block devices. Like people have tried this over the years, but from an engineering perspective, and you, it's oftentimes you you do have to rely on the OS, but you want to minimize your contact with it because the OS is going to be your enemy. Other questions? All right, I don't spend too much time on MMAP. This is suffice to say, it's a bad idea. Don't do it. Uh, if I die, you know, you can put on my tombstone. Never use MMAP for your database. Um, and the reason why I, I, was, I was want to bring this up is because, you know, we invite a lot of these different database companies and startups to come give talks at CMU. And surprisingly, over the last couple of years, a lot of them mentioned they're using MMAP. And we ask them why, and they say, oh, because it's quick and easy to use. And then when we go talk to them a few years later, like, oh, yeah, that was a huge mistake. We should not have done MMAP. We should have done what Lecture 6 is going to teach you, right? So here's a listing of some systems that I know using MMAP. There's a couple others I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing. There's a bunch of hobby projects. Um, so the ones at the top, these are full users. These are systems where they entirely use MMAP for all management of data back and forth from disk and memory. Um, the most famous one of these is probably Elastic. Uh, MonaDB was a column store out of um, uh, uh, CWI, the same place that built DuckDB. The LMDB dude is probably the exact opposite of me. Where I'm saying never use MMAP, he's like always, always use MMAP. And he's been banned on a bunch of different databases mailing lists because he would email them and say, like, you guys should be using, you should be using LMDB, you should be using MMAP, right? He's wrong. Um, he's <laughs> is weird. Uh, <laughs> but here's the ones, the, the ones at the bottom that were sort of partially using it. Uh, actually, I would put Mongo as full user. They should really be at the top. But the ones at the bottom here, they all got rid of it. Right, because of all the issues that I, that I mentioned before, you can get you can get something up and running pretty quickly if you use MMAP because again you don't have to build your own buffer pool manager. But because you're relying on the OS to move data back and forth, it's going to make horrible decisions. Right? I'm not going to I don't want to pick on Mongo, but Mongo is the best example of this. Mongo started off with an MMAP based storage engine, storage manager, and they were they were the hot database in the 2010s. They raised a ton of you know investor money, and they had really good engineers. So they and they were based on time on MMAP. If MMAP was the right choice, then they could have, you know, and the, they could have made that work. But what did they do? They threw it all away, and they bought Wire Tiger, was a storage manager that doesn't use MMAP, right? So again, just to reiterate, never use we, we don't want to use the OS to manage memory because the data system is always going to be a better position to do this. And it's not just for managing memory; it's basically for everything. We don't want to use the OS for scheduling. We don't want to use the OS for for caching writes. Uh, we don't want the US use the OS for uh, and the network stuff you sort of need to in some cases, but you, there's, there's tricks with that. But like, the OS is always going to be a problem. Uh, and again, for, for MMAP, again, I'll send this link on Piazza. We wrote a paper about this and why you don't want to use this. And then there's a 10-minute there's a YouTube video cartoon about all, all the problems. Okay? So again, the OS is, is going to be a problem for us, and we have to design our system to, to deal with it. All right, so for database storage, there's two problems we got to deal with. How are we going to re represent the, the, the database on these files on disk? And then once we have those, how do we move data back and forth from disk in, into memory? So today's lecture is going to be on the, on the first problem here, and then we'll cover the, the, the second problem uh, in, in the upcoming lectures. OK? All right. So there's going to be sort of three layers of, of what data is going to look like on these disk pages. Um, so the first question is, you know, what do these files actually look like? Um, and then within a file, there's going to be pages, because we're going to have to break it up into to different chunks. And then, and then we'll discuss what these pages look like. And then within that page, we're going to have tuples, the data itself of the, the, the tables. Um, we, we can ignore indexes for now. And you have to decide what do those, what do those actually tuples look like. So we're sort of start at the top and then we'll go deeper, deeper inside of, of these, these files to understand what, what they actually contain. So as I said before, the database system is going to maintain a database as one more files on disk. SQLite, DuckDB, those are all single file databases. All the enterprise databases or Postgres, MySQL, every other system, you know, more full featured system, is going to be running, you know, maintaining multiple files for, for your tables and databases. And so the the, the format that the, these files are going, to, are going to be based on is typically going to be proprietary or custom to whatever the database system actually is, right? Like, meaning like you can't take the Postgres database files 
and open them up in, in MySQL or open them up in SQLite. Now, DuckDB, because they want to be portable and compatible with, with SQLite, they have connectors that allow you to read you know, SQLite files and other things. But in general, all the major database systems are going to have their own proprietary format. And the OS doesn't know anything about what's inside of these files. It doesn't know what's inside of a page. It doesn't know where indexes are versus tables are. It just knows nothing. It just sees a bunch of files. So next class, we'll talk about portable file formats, things like Parquet, Avro, Orc, Arrow. These are going to be uh, open source specifications for what a, what a database file could look like. And then there's a bunch of different data systems that know how to, to read them and access them and write them. But we'll, we'll, we'll worry about those later. And as I said before, in the 1980s, there was a sort of a lot of the earlier database systems decided that they, they not only were they going to have customized file formats, they were also going to have customized file systems. And they weren't going to use ext3 didn't didn't exist. You know, b3fs didn't exist back then. But they whatever the equivalent was in the 80s, they didn't want to rely on what the OS said what the file system was. They wanted to do everything themselves. But that's a lot of engineering work, and, and nobody does that today. And it usually get a, a marginal benefit. Um, the only systems that still do this would be like what I'll call enterprise systems. So this would be Oracle, the DB2s, the Teradatas. You know, these are like million-dollar database systems that are trying to get as much best, you know, much performance as you can. Uh, these systems will support this, in addition to running off the, you know, the generic OS uh, file systems. All right, so then the, the, the part of the database system that's going to be responsible for maintaining and coordinating these different files is we'll call generically as the storage manager. Sometimes it's called the storage engine, right? It's the same idea. And it's going to be the part of the system that communicates with the, either the hardware, or, to, or communicates with the hardware, or whatever the storage device is, either through the OS or using direct, direct access, to you know, retrieve data and bring it into to the database systems, database systems memory. And so we'll discuss this next class. I keep saying this, but there's, there's, there's so many things to discuss. Um, a bunch of these systems will maintain their own sort of disk scheduler or dispatcher that decides when, what pages to read in what order. Because otherwise, if you just go do much F reads against the OS, the OS is going to figure out how to order things. But again, the, the, the database system is in a better position to know what it actually needs uh, and, and in what order. So various systems can, can, can have their own thread decide how to schedule their own disk reads. And you want to do this because you want to minimize the amount of thrashing of bringing things into memory and how to throw it, throw it out right away. So if you know two queries need the same page, maybe you bring that in first before some other pages. And then you, you throw away the, the, the first page once you know those two queries are done with it. So the database files are going to be broken up into what are called pages. And the database system is going to be responsible for keeping track of what, what data has been read and written to these various pages. Um, and then keeps track of how much space is available in each of them. Because again, if I, if I, insert a new, I need to insert a new tuple, I need to find a page that has space for me. So I'll keep track of some directory that says, this page has this amount of space, and, and go put it in there. Now, the database system itself, at the storage manager layer, the part we're talking about here, it's not going to maintain multiple copies of, of these pages for redundancy or replication purposes. We assume that's going to happen either both above and below uh, this part of the system in the stack. So above would be like something, uh, something that knows if, if a query shows up and wants to do a write, send it to another, another physical box or another node and have both of those machines do the write. And then below it would be like if you're running RAID or some kind of storage appliance that knows how to replicate pages. And then down below, it'll do that as well. Typically, database management systems will not maintain multiple copies themselves because it's a bunch of extra work uh, that ideally you don't want to have to do. All right, so what is a page? So in our view, from a database perspective, a page is going to be a fixed size block of data. Um, and it can contain data from any part of the database itself. Right? Again, for, for, for this lecture, we assume it's just tuples or records. But it can contain indexes, log information, additional metadata, the catalog, uh, statistics. Right? It doesn't matter. Um, but it's still going to be broken up into to these, these, these fixed size blocks. Most systems are not going to mix page types. Meaning you don't take like a, a one megabyte page and put in data from this table and this table and, and index and stuff like that, right? For simplicity, you're going to assume that one page belongs to some object in the database, a table or index and so forth, and it would only contain data for that particular object. Some systems are going to require every page to be self-contained, meaning all the information, all the metadata you need to have in order to understand what's inside that page 
has to be included in the page itself. So Oracle is probably the most famous one that does this. Right? So within a page, you have to keep track of like it belongs to this table and has these columns with this, these types and so forth. And the reason why they want to do this is because if there's some corruption in, in, you know, in, in the database files, right, you don't want to have some page that contains the, the metadata about the table get blown away, and then now you can't understand what's in any other page. Right? Again, replication can, can, can solve this problem. Harbor has certainly got a lot more reliable. Uh, in, in modern times than it did before. Like hard drives used, you know, were super flaky before. Um, they're still not ideal, but they're, they're, they're much better than they used to be. So this, maybe this, having every page be self-contained is, is less of an issue today. Um, but it, this was a design choice that Oracle made uh, very early on. Now every page in our database file is going to be given a unique identifier, like a, a page ID, like you know, some, some number, 64-bit integer, 32-bit integer. And then there'll be some method or some mechanism that the data system is going to use to allow it to map a page ID to some physical location on our storage device. And again, that could be like a file name inside of a directory at some offset. If we're running on like a cloud storage, it could be an S3 bucket at some offset and so forth. Right? For my purpose, it doesn't matter. We just have a way to say, if we're looking at page one, two, three, there's some method to say, here's where to go find it. So now, What's sort of confusing in the concept of databases is that there's, there's three different notions of what a page actually is. And so at the lowest level, you have what is called a hardware page. Uh, and this is typically four kilobytes. And this is going to be the, uh, the, the, the largest size or the, the, the smallest size of a page or a, a block of data that the hardware can guarantee that it, it can do atomic writes. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by atomic writes? He says all or nothing. Right. So it means that if I tell the hardware I want to write four kilobytes, and, it, and I get back an acknowledgment that, yes, I wrote four kilobytes, then I, I can assume that it made it. If I need to write eight kilobytes, and I, and I send that as two four kilobyte blocks down to the OS, to, to, sorry, to the hardware, I may write the first four kilobytes and then crash and then come back, and then the, 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 the second four kilobytes didn't make it. Right? There's no guarantee, the hardware can't guarantee that it can do that all atomically, like all or nothing. And so because of this, we have to do a bunch of other extra stuff inside of our database system to, to deal with that. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that later. And then above that, above the hardware, now that's going to be, the operating system is going to have a, its own notion of a page. And in Linux, by default, this is four kilobytes. Um, and again, this is like mapping something that's in the hardware to, to something that's in, in virtual memory. Now, in, uh, in, X, in X64, they also support two different modes, or sort of huge pages, as they're called. So you can get page sizes actually two megabytes and one gigabyte. And again, the hardware can't guarantee that it can, it can write out four kilobytes atomically. This is just to reduce the amount of bookkeeping that the OS does for the pages that, that it brings into memory. And then within inside that now, above that, the database system is going to have its own notion of a page as well, right? And typically, this is going to be anywhere in the range of 512, kilo, uh, 512 bytes. This is what SQLite does, up to, I think, 32 kilobytes. Some systems let you go up to 64 kilobytes, right? And so the, the page size is, is going to be the way we'll represent where to find, uh, sorry, the page ID is a way to represent at what offset in some file for a given page size, can we find the data that, that we're looking for? So as I said, most systems are, the default is going to be four kilobytes. Uh, in SQL Server and Postgres, the, the page size is going to be eight kilobytes. And then in MySQL, they go up to uh, 16 kilobytes. For something like DB2 and enterprise, actually for, for DB2, on a per table basis, you can change the, the page size. And I take a guess, anybody, edit, would anybody take a guess why one page size, a larger page size might be a better idea? What did I say in the beginning? What, what do we want to try to maximize? Sequential. Sequential access, correct, yes. So if I now have, uh, if I'm organizing on disk 16 kilobyte blocks and I need to read 16 kilobytes of data, then it's one, one sort of call to, the, to our dis dispatcher in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the database system that makes one call to the OS to go grab contiguous 16 kilobytes. If I'm using four kilobyte pages, then I got to make separate calls 
uh, or may do separate lookups to go get the data in random, potentially random locations. And there's, there's syscalls you can make to the OS or to, to the device itself that when you allocate data that you want things to be ideally cont contiguously aligned. You can like pre-allocate an extent to say, allocate me a 10 megabyte block of data and then the, 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 then the data system can divide that 10 megabyte block into you know, eight kilobyte chunks or whatever the uh, block size it wants. Yes? Then wouldn't larger page sizes make life harder because then you don't have geometry? Right, so then he says, and he's correct, doesn't this mean that large page sizes make writes more expensive? Because now if I only have to write one kilobyte, but I'm storing as a 16 kilobyte page, I got to write it all 16 kilobytes. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So this is a good point. This is something I would say throughout the entire semester. Uh, it's, I mean, it's not just for databases, it's computer science in general. There's no free lunch. There's going to be pros and cons to, to each of these. And then in different situations, one approach might be better than another. If my workload is entirely read-only, if I never write anything, then yeah, I want large page sizes, assuming I'm doing the large sequential scans. If I'm doing a bunch of writes, then maybe I want something smaller. But what the right amount is, depends. Yes? So Curse even has some kind of read coercion where if you have a small page size, so effectively, if you have like many four kilobyte reads, you're going to effectively coerce them into, say, 16 kilobytes of read to avoid the overhead to each system call. And then you'll still have the write benefit. So if you're writing, you still have atomic writes with so, small page size. Like, yeah, so his statement is, if I do 16 kilobyte reads, and I'm still using 4 kilobytes of data, assuming that 16 kilobytes is contiguous, then can't I go make a, uh, you know, go make a, a single call to get the 16 kilobytes that are contiguous, and then if I have to write individual, within individual 4 kilobytes, I can still write those out. Absolutely, yes. And this is what I was saying before. We will then choose algorithms or methods that, that try to write the data out that, so that it is contiguous, so that we can do those, those fetches, right? And again, this is something a data system can do for us, because we know what the query is, we know what data you're going to potentially read, and so we can read ahead for you and try to fetch things that are uh, you know, before you actually need them. Now, the OS can do that with prefetching as well, but it can only prefetch things that are contiguous uh, in both directions, I think, in Linux, yes. But it can't do, if I have to prefetch things that aren't contiguous, it can't do that for me. All right, so is this clear? So again, there'll be some page ID, and we'll see this in a second, how this is being used, that's going to allow us to say, for page, you know, page one or three, here's where to go find it. All right, so now we've got to talk about how do we actually keep track of that mapping of page IDs to locations. Um, and there's a, this would be one of the big differences of how the data systems are going to organize the, and their pages. Um, and again, there's not, I'm not saying one way is better than another. I'll describe the heap file approach as the most common one. Uh, but certainly, a bunch of other systems are, are doing different things. Uh, and, there, and there's trade-offs for all these ones. So at this point where we're in our discussion, we don't need to know anything about what's inside of our pages. Like Again, we don't care whether, whether it's indexes or tuples. We just need to know, for a given page, wh where, how do I go find it, and how to keep track of what pages I actually have. So tree files is basically you store, um, you can store the, the, like sort of in the leaf nodes, you can store the actual pages themselves, or you could, you could have a hash table. I, I, ISAM, uh, or sequential sorted files, this is something from like the 70s. My SQL used to do this by default. It's not that common anymore, but it's, again, it's another way to sort of keep track of things. And then hashing file is, again, you use the hash table to look ups. Heap file is going to be the most, most common one, um, but the, these other methods exi exist. And then for the log structure stuff, we'll see that next class. Uh, it, it, how do I say this? The, the directory is really keeping track. You still want to use potentially heap file to keep track of where, where things are. Because we don't care about what's, we don't care at this point what's inside the pages. All right, so heap file is just going to be an un, uh, a collection of unordered pages uh, where our tuples will be stored in random order. And again, the relational model allows us to do that because the relational model doesn't find or doesn't says that the data doesn't have to be specified in an exact order. Some systems might pre-sort them uh, to make things faster for other, other effects, but the relational model doesn't require you to do that. And so the only API we need in our storage manager to support a heap file is basically to create pages, get a page, write to a page, uh, delete a page, and then an iterator API to allow us to, to, to sequentially read pages. Right, to get the list of all the page IDs that we have and, and read over them. So managing this heap file is really easy to do if your database is a single file, like in DuckDB or like in, in, in SQLite. Right? Because all you need to do to find a given page 
is just know what pa the page number is. You know what the size of the page is, because they all have to be the same size. And now you just do a simple arithmetic, like take whatever the, the ID I'm looking for, multiply it by the, the size of the page, and then I can jump to whatever that offset is in the file. And I know exactly what I'm looking for. And if you go look in the SQLite documentation, they, they talk about how uh, in, in the header of their, of their database file, all sort of the, the metadata that they keep track of to basically do, do this trick here. Where things get tricky is if, if you have multiple files, which again, most systems do. Postgres does, MySQL does, Oracle does. And then now we need a way to say, all right, for given page number two, what file and at what offset, you know, what directory or what file and what offset has, has the page uh, that, that I need. All right? And this is what a heap file page directory can get, get for us. Again, think of it as it's like a hash table where you're just keeping track of, it's mapping from the page ID to, to the, the pages in the data file. And this typically be a sort of special file either at the header of, of, the, of the, the single database file or at some special location inside of uh, the database system and a directory. And you can sort of think it's a database within the database. It's the database that keeps track of what's in your database. Right? It's, it's, the catalog is part of that as too, but this is like keeping track of where the physical location things are. And so this has to be kept in sync with the actual files on disk because I don't want to create a bunch of pages, not update my page directory, I crash and come back, and now my page directory doesn't know about these other pages, and I, I can't get to them, right? So there's, there's a bunch of extra tricks we have to do to make sure that these things are maintained, are, are kept in sync. Again, so just think, like, I have a bunch of pages. They're on some, they're on some location, a bunch of files. doesn't matter where. And then it, it's just a mapping to tell me where to go find it. Additional metadata we can keep track of, like, for every single page, we can keep track of, in a central location, the number of free slots that they actually have or, or free space they have. So now, again, if I want to insert a tuple and I got to find a page to put it in, I don't want to have to scan them all and figure out who's got free space. My page directory would, would tell me that, right? And then if I run out of pages, it, I know how to allocate them and then update my page directory to, to point this as well. Again, just think, think of a hash table that's getting written to disk that keeps track of the pages that I have. But then I can also, again, iterate or scan through and say, here's page one, here's page two, here's page three, because we're going to need this if we have an access method like a sequential scan operator, right, if we don't have an index, we need to be able to iterate over there every, every single tube on the table. So the page directory needs to be able to expose us that, that API. Yes? Yeah, so you mentioned in case of a crash, so that means because the directory is part of the volatile memory, do I also have to write it to the storage somewhere? Yeah, so his question is, because the directory has to be brought into memory in order to read it, uh, it's, in, it's in non volatile memory, so now if I crash, uh, I don't want to lose it. Does that mean any changes I make to it have to be written to disk? Yes. But, like, but it's not as bad as, like, you're not updating this thing all the time, right? So you're not going to, you know, if, if you run out of space in your, in your database file and you allocate more pages, you're not going to allocate just one page, right? Because then you could potentially do that for every single query. You'll allocate, like, you know, a gigabyte of data, update your page directory, that gets written to disk once, you make sure that's persistent and it's safe, then you proceed with running the query. So, so that means any update to the directory has to be written at our board. Yeah, so the statement is every, any update to the page directory has to be written to disk? Absolutely, yes. Because otherwise you don't, know what's, you don't know what you have. Yes. Yes? Uh, is this directly stored in a special uh, database file or is it stored along with other pages? This question is, is this stored in a, in a special database file or is it stored along with other pages? What do you mean by special? Just like, like a separate file? Yeah. yeah, so some systems will store this as a separate file. Uh, SQLite will store this in the header of the file. Um, typically, it's stored, it's stored separately. Yes? When you say that the database uses multiple files, do you mean that a single table uses multiple files? Or the database uses like maybe one file? So his question is, when I say a database system can use multiple files, do I mean within one table does it, does it contain multiple files? Or within the database does it contain multiple files? Yeah. Anyone? Doesn't... So yeah, so DuckDB uses one file for all the tables, same as SQLite. But, uh, I mean, we can pop up in Postgres and just look in the data directory. There's a bunch of files in there that have numbers in them, and they're, they're, they're various data files. And sometimes they'll be for indexes, sometimes they'll be for tables, right? And every, the various systems do different things. And again, not to, to keep repeating myself, this is the beauty of, of SQL. I don't know, don't care in my SQL queries whether I have one file or a thousand files, right? The data systems can decide how to do that. It just knows how to run your query for you. So again, different data systems do different things. Uh, how do you know when you want to use multiple files for one page? 
question is, how do you know whether you want to use multiple files for, for one table? Um, again, it depends. So like if we won't talk about large, large columns yet, but like, see, say, say you have a, a, you have a table that has a, a, a blob field or a, a text field, like, and then that's like 10 megabytes. You'd want to store that in, in separate pages, but maybe you want to store that compressed because it's, it's a bunch of text data. So you have the regular columns of the integers and floats, whatever. That's stored in one file, and then your, your large stuff is stored in another file, right? So that's one approach, but you can imagine also too, maybe you just, you just you have some space in a single file where the top part's the fixed stuff, the bottom's the variable length. It depends. I think my SQL up to the 5.6 used to store, I think it was one file for all tables, uh, or all databases, and then they, they, they mentioned, no, it was one file per database, and they split it up to be one file, not per table. And separate files for indexes. Okay. All right. So now we know sort of roughly at a high level what the, the, the files look like, or the, how the files are laid out, and how we keep track of where they exist. Um, so let's now talk about what's inside, what's actually inside the pages themselves. So every page is going to have a header that's going to tell you something about what's what what the data actually is. So a common thing would be like the page size or like a checksum, right? So if you crash and come back or you restart the system, or actually anytime you fetch something from disk, you compute a fast checksum to make sure that the data isn't corrupted. Um, maybe keep track of the, the version of the database system that actually created the, the page. That way if like you put out a new version that breaks compatibility, you can have some code that, that knows how to still read the old data. We won't talk about transactions until after the midterm, but like you can tr keep track of like what thread or what transaction wrote to what data in this and whether it's actually visible to whatever, whatever query you're running. If the data is compressed or encoded in a certain way, which we'll, we'll discuss next week, there'll be metadata about what, how, what the compression scheme actually is. There'll be information about what the, the schema is or what the table schema is, as we talked about Oracle does. Sometimes there, there's additional statistics about what's in the data itself. So like for a given column, what's the min, the min value and the max value? Because maybe I just need to read that instead of actually reading the data to figure out whether um, I, there's something I need, right? And again, as we already discussed, Oracle is, is famously self-contained, but not not all systems do that. So now, within the page itself, uh, we need to decide how we actually want to organize the tuple data, right? So at this point in this lecture, we're going to assume that we're only storing tuples in our pages. Uh, we'll discuss indexes later. And then we're going to assume that we're storing tuples in a row-oriented manner, meaning like if I have five attributes, I will have a, I will have a tuple, and I'll have those five attributes contiguously before I see the next tuple. Next or next week, we'll see about column stores. We store this slightly different, but for our purposes here, uh, we assume it's that's row-oriented, and we'll break this next week. All right. So there's three different approaches of what what, what could actually be in our pages. So the tuple-oriented storage, where we're only storing tuples and the exact values that those tuples have. There'll be a log structured approach where we just store deltas of what changed since the last time, uh, or since the last time this tuple was updated. Uh, and that should be index organized. Uh, index organized storage would be, it could be like a tree structure where in the leaf nodes, I'm actually storing the data itself. So today's lecture, we're only going to talk about the first one, uh, tuple index storage. And then next week, we'll talk about uh, the two other approaches, OK? All right, so let's think about how do we actually want to store tuples in our pages, All right? So let's say we have a really simple approach where in our page header, we just keep track of the number of tuples that we have, right? And anytime you want to insert a new tuple, we just append it to the end, right? So we can assume our data is fixed length. So if I want to insert a new tuple, I just go look at the header, see the number of tuples, uh, multiply that by the size of the tuple, and that tells me where offset I want to write the page. What's wrong? Oh, lantern fly. Just kill it. <laughs> is, is, is anybody wanting to keep that alive? <laughs> uh, for those on YouTube, we have a lantern fly infestation. Um, all right. Uh, right, so is this a good idea or a bad idea? <coughs> I said straw man, so it's obviously a bad idea. But why is it a bad idea? 
Right, so if I delete tuple, so I, I delete tuple uh, two, it throws everything out of order. Right, because now if it's at, I, I, what I want to be able to do is uh, insert a new tuple, and I don't want to put it at the end, I want to use this spot here, right? So, you know, number of tuples is enough. M maybe I can keep track of like where things are located so I can decide where to put them in, right? But it's, you know, it, it's going beyond what I'm showing here. What's another obvious problem? One of the tuples too big to be stored on the page. He says, what if the, one of the tuples is too big to store on the page? Yes, but also, what if they're not the fixed length? Which most data is, is not fixed length, right? Email addresses aren't the same size. Uh, Android IDs aren't the same, always the same size. Now, I could just sort it as a char type, but what does that do? That preallocates the, the space I need. And you know, if, if the largest email address is, is one kilobyte, then I have to store one kilobyte for every single email address, even though it's not going to be using that space, right? Then his comment is, well, what if the table can't, or the, sorry, the, the, the tuple can't fit in this page? How do I spam multiple pages? We'll discuss that next week, but also this also would not work, right? So clearly, this you know this is not enough for us. We need additional metadata to keep track of, uh, keep track of you know how how we actually we want to store this. Another problem too is like again, if if four, if four couldn't go here, right? I couldn't fill the gap uh, where when I deleted two. If four needs to go here, uh, then I'm wasting space. But if I want to maybe move three up. But now I have to tell the rest of the system that I've moved three, right? Because I haven't told you how I'm pointing to three, how I find three. Uh, but assuming it's going to be like some offset within this page. But now if I'm moving three, then, then I have to go update every possible index that is maybe pointing to it. And that's going to be super expensive. So the most common approach to handle this problem is called slotted pages. And what I'll describe here isn't you know, isn't going to be exactly how every system does this, but at a high level, this is what everyone is doing. If you're if you're a row-oriented database system uh, that's using tuple-oriented pages, so not not log structured, then they're doing something that looks like this. So we're going to have in our in we'll have a header that again, keeps track of all the, the metadata we talked about before. But then after the header, uh, we'll have the slot array, where the the at every position in that slot array is going to point to some tuple. Uh, in, in our page. And the tuples will be starting at the bottom, at the end of the page. Right? So at the bottom, we'll have all the fixed length and var, var length tuple data. For now, I'll assume that, that everything is put together. Right? So meaning like there isn't, a, if you have a really large value, it isn't stored in a separate, separate page. The, the, the entire tuple has to be stored inside this page. And so the slot array is just going to be storing fixed length offsets to where to find the starting location of individual tuples. And maybe you could also store the, the, the size and the tuple in the header if, if, you, if you wanted to. Right? So now what's going to happen is, as we need to update the, the, the table and add new pages, sorry, add new tuples inside the page, the slot array is going to grow from, from the beginning to the end. And then all our tuple data is going to grow from the end to the beginning. And any single time I add a new entry into my slot array, or sorry, a new tuple, I just I put a, uh, you know, I, I update the slot array to tell me where to, where to go find it, right? So now if I go back to the problem I had before where I say I deleted tuple three, uh, well, this is fine because I didn't move any other tuples. The slot array still, you know, f for four still points to it. So I don't have to tell any, any other part of the system that I moved four, right? But even, you know, if I now want to reclaim this, this space that I've, that I've, that I've that's been, or three used to be and I deleted, if I want to slide three or four over to, to take to you know compact it, all I need to do now is just update the slot array to point to the new offset, which is easy to do. I don't have to. Again, relational model says I don't have to do this. Some, some systems do, some systems don't. We'll see this in a second, right? And this is all fine. So this is what SQLite. Uh, actually, I don't know if SQLite does this, but this is what Postgres does. This is my. Uh, my SQL doesn't do this. SQL Server does this. Right, this slotted pages is the most common approach. This is what everyone does. Um, yes? Uh, do you then reuse the third number slot array, like if you want to insert a new one? So his question is, can I reuse slot position 3 if I start a new tuple? Yes. But I don't have to put that in front of 4. Right? I can put it anywhere. Other questions? Yes? 
a small amount of memory if like the sequels are like very long. Yeah, so her, que her statement is, her question is, wouldn't this be wasting space if the tuples are variable length? Yeah, so the, again, my tuples are growing from the, from the, from the, the tuple data is growing from the end to the beginning. The slot array is going from the beginning to the end. At some point, I'm going to run out of space, and there might be a little bit of, like, you know, little, little space in the middle that I can't use for anything. Is that wasted? Yes. But the advantage we get of not having to update other things Anytime we, we, we shuffle the, with the, the order of the slot array is, is worth that cost. OK. So now, assuming we're sort of thinking in slotted pages, now we need a way to identify tuples. And this, for this one, we're going to use the, this, the notion of a record ID. Different data systems might, may, may call this the row ID or the row number. Right? But a high level, the way to think about this is it's a, it's a way to uniquely identify some logical tuple uh, based on its physical location inside of a file, inside of a page. And it's typically going to be a combination of like a file number, or an ID number, a, the page number, and then the slot number that corresponds where they exist in that slot array. So that when you want to do a lookup to say, I need, I need this tuple, if you have the record ID, you would then look in the page directory and figure out what page has it, to go grab that page, then use the slot number inside the slot array to figure out where the, you know, what, what offset inside that page has the data you're looking for. So most databases will not store this record ID. This is something that's synthesized, materialized, again, based on the page directory or, you know, of, 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 uh, or how, how you're keeping track of how to find things, meaning like within the tuple data itself, I'm not storing this record ID. SQLite does store this as a separate column that, that you're not supposed to see, but you can get to it. And the way they do this, the reason why they do this is because this is how they're going to, they're going to use this, use this as the primary key to allow them to identify individual tuples. So if like I, we, we haven't talked about secondary indexes, but I have, if I have an index that's not the primary key index, my, my value when I, when, do, when I do my lookup on a key is going to be that row ID, which I then use in the primary key row ID index to find the data I need. Different systems do different things. So the size of this is going to vary. Uh, based on implementation. So Postgres is going to be six, kil uh, six bytes. Uh, SQLite is going to be eight bytes or 64 bits. Uh, SQL Server has an eight byte one, and then Oracle has uh, a 10 byte uh, rec record ID. Again, you can see this directly in the database system. Uh, so we can do a quick demo just to sh show you all this. Um, so you're not supposed to use this in your application, right? So even though this will uniquely identify a, um, a tuple, Again, it's, it's the physical location of it, and it could change. Meaning, like, if I insert a tuple and I get a record ID, if, I, if my application then references it, the problem could be, like, I could run compaction or garbage collection, or in Postgres it's called the vacuum, where I could reorganize that page where maybe now the slot number changes or the page number changes, and now the thing I'm looking for isn't there anymore. So again, this is a physical aspect of the database system that we're not supposed to really use in our application, but it's exposed to us because if we need to administer or maintain these systems, we need to know where the data actually is. Um, so let me log in real quickly, sorry. I may need to reconnect, sorry. All right, so we'll do Postgres first. Um, so we're, we're going to create a really simple table R. That just has three tuples, right? 100, 101, and 102. So Postgres has something called the CTID. And this is going to be a tuple now that's going to give you the, the page number and then the slot number. So these tuples here are at page 0, slot 1, slot 2, slot 3, right? So now, if I... Say I delete the second tuple. I, I delete 101. Now when I do my scan, again, now you can see that Postgres decided it, it deleted the tuple, uh, and, but it didn't, it didn't move things around. Right? It left the data where it, actually, it, it, you know, where it actually lives. But I can run garbage, the, the garbage collection. Or actually, let me, let me insert a tuple back. So I'll insert 103. Now you can see, again, it didn't take that 
that, that O2 slot from the first tuple I deleted, just append it to the N, put it in slot 4. Right? So then again, I can now run the, um, again, in Postgres, it's called the vacuum. So the command is vacuum. Again, this is a Postgres idiom. So vacuum full is going to have Postgres basically compact every single page and write out a new, new, new pages, new files. So I, I, if I have a bunch of pages that are, that are empty, it'll, it'll release them when it, when it creates a new version. So now when I do that same query before, right, now you see it, decided, it compacted it, right? You put 1, it put 01, 02, 03, right? Make sense? Yes? So is this, um, this API you referring to the, the um, page number and offset and slot, or, or slot number? So is it the slot number like in the, like going backwards or is it in the slot array? It's in the slot array. Because oh, okay. then you use the slot array to say what offset in the, within the page do I find what I need. Yes? The question is, the, the slot array starts at zero index, even though the page starts at zero index. Sorry, slot array starts at one index, page starts at zero index. Is there something in, uh, in one? Let's find out. So you're not supposed to do this, but you can do, you can actually query this, right? CTID equals, and then O, O. That doesn't have anything there. Right, but I, I can get the other one. So I, I don't know why they do that. Yes? Statement is um, when we say a slot, uh, the, the CTID is going to be six bytes, so it's probably a, a four byte page number and then a two byte offset. Doesn't that limit the number of slots we can have in a page? Yes, but Postgres is by default is eight kilobyte page sizes, so you can't have a billion tuples in a single page. All right, so let's, let's look at other systems. So, again, SQLite is it's different. So, SQLite, uh, they have this row ID. Again, and it's actually storing this, right? It's a 64-bit integer, and it actually stores this. So, like, uh, it uses this as the primary key. Yes? Is the size of the tuple stored somewhere? So question, is the size of the tuple stored somewhere? Typically in the header of the tuple, yes. All right, so, this, so if we delete from, uh, we'll delete a tuple, run the same query, right? It, does, it doesn't reuse the row ID because it's, it's actually a physical thing, the primary key. All right, so let's do now SQL Server. So SQL Server has this different syntax. It has this double, that's uh, hard to see. If I highlight it, can you see it? No. There's, two percent, there's percent signs there, trust me. Uh, sorry, let's go back. All right, there you go. There you go. There's percent signs. Sorry. Um, so when you run this, you get back some, some hex data like this, right? What does this mean? So there's a undocumented command. Actually, this is all, like, this is all you're not supposed to do this, but you can. Um, like, it's, it's not documented, meaning Microsoft doesn't officially support this. But there is a command called whatever, this, this function here, and you pass in the physical location, and then you'll, you'll get back now the, the formatted file number, the page number, and then the slot number, right? And you can actually, it's interesting in, I learned this today, you can actually get back what the, that function is actually doing. So you, you can get it to spit back the, what it actually does. And you see here where they're, they're taking that physical location and how they're jumping to different bytes to get the, the page ID, file number, and, and the slot number, right? So let's do the same thing we did before. Let's delete 101. Uh, then we'll run the same query to get the page number and offsets, right? So in this case here, it didn't move anything, right? So now if we insert our tuple back, or insert a new tuple, run that same query. Now look what it did. So my tuple before with ID 102, that was at slot 2. But when I inserted the new tuple, it moved that second tuple 102 into slot 2 and then put the, the new tuple into slot 3. 
Postgres didn't do that, right? Postgres just kept depending on the end. Is this wrong? Who knows? Is it better? Who knows, right? And the reason why you can do this is because when you fetch a page and bring it to memory and you start you know, inserting a tuple into it, you're holding the latch or the lock on that page. The, the data system can decide whether it wants to do compaction or whatever the optimization wants to do because it knows that no other thread can write to that page at the same time. So we can decide whether or not we want, we want to uh, you know, compact it or not as we do it. Postgres doesn't do it. SQL, SQL Server does. All right, let's look at everyone's favorite Oracle. Um, which I need to create the table first, I think. And then, I don't think it's gonna let me do that. No, it did. All right, so, so in Oracle, they have a row ID, right? But you get again some some binary data here, right? Uh, and again, this is. Stack Overflow, this is not me, but there's a bunch of functions you can do to run this, <laughs> right? And then you can see now they're storing an object ID, a file number, a block number, or the page number, and then the row slot, right? So it's, again, this is something, taking something that's defined in the textbook, describing it at a, like a logical level, or describing it at a, I mean, it's a theoretical level, here's how to organize your database system, and then you can see different implementations of it. Through SQL, you can then see how you know they are sorting slots, sort of things in slot, slotted pages. All right. All right. So, in the sake of time, um, I think I'm going to skip. I mean, th this will segue into to, to next class, but um, the tuple itself is just going to be a sequence of bytes. Right? There's some header and then, and then a byte sequence. And then it's up for the database system to know how to interpret those bytes based on the type and you know, based on the, the values that, that you're looking at. So again, we'll cover this next class, but the way to think about this is like, there'll be some header that contains information about whether this tuple is visible or not. We can store, you know, whether or not we want to store, keep track of what columns have nulls. And then, uh, you know, and then the execution engine will know how to you know, jump to different offsets within the tuple based on the schema. So again, we'll cover this uh, in next class. Um, but just to finish up, the again, what do we what do we discuss today? There's a database system. It's going to be to maintain a database. That database can be tracked in in across different files and broken up into pages. And then we have different ways to keep track of those pages, keep track of what's in, how to store things in those pages. And then next class we'll talk about what how to store actually the tuples. Okay. So again, a lot to discuss next next class. Have a good weekend. See ya. Hit it. Shit is gangsta. <laughs> gangsta. <laughs> Bad boys are gangsta. <laughs> you ain't nothing but gangsta. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the fetch can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 will send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. <laughs> I ain't lying for that cake, your fam will see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great. <laughs>